Good evening. I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the Lyndon Baines Presidential Library and Museum. I want to welcome you here tonight. In what was perhaps the most important speech of his long political career, a plea to Congress to put into law voting rights in 1965, Lyndon Johnson began with the words, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions and all colors, from every section of this country to join me in this cause. Nearly half a century after those words were spoken, we are honored to have in the library that bears Lyndon Johnson's name, the 82nd Attorney General of the United States of America, Eric Holder. <laughs> Attorney General Holder will speak tonight about the state of voting rights in America today. And we'll offer his view on how measures are being taken that threaten to suppress the rights that Lyndon Johnson and others worked to ensure in 1965. After the Attorney General's speech, he and I will have a conversation where we will answer some of the questions that you submitted this evening. The Attorney General brings extensive legal experience to his current role. A native of New York City, Attorney General Holder is a graduate of Columbia College and Columbia Law School and worked for the Department of Justice upon graduation as part of the Attorney General's Honors Program. In 1988, President Reagan named Mr. Holder as an Associate Judge of the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. And in 1997, President Bill Clinton tapped him to become Deputy Attorney General of the United States. After going into private practice, Mr. Holder stepped back into public service shortly after President Obama tapped him to be the Attorney General in December, this time three years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. And uh, thank you, Mark Updegrove. It is a, a pleasure to be with you and to join so many friends, colleagues, and critical partners in welcoming some of our nation's most dedicated and effective civil rights champions, as well as the many University of Texas law students who are here and who will lead this work into the future. So for you UT folks, there we go, okay. <laughs> I'd also, yeah, we can applaud, that's okay. I'd also like to thank Mark and his staff, as well as the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library and Museum's board members and community of supporters for providing a forum for today's conversation and for all that you do, not only to honor the life and legacy of our 36th Commander-in-Chief, but also to build upon his historic efforts to ensure the strength, the integrity, and the future of our democracy. Nearly half a century has passed since a national tragedy catapulted Lyndon Johnson to the presidency, and at the same time, launched a new chapter in America's story. Those of us who lived through those painful days will never forget LBJ's first presidential speech to a nation in mourning and in desperate need of strong and steady leadership. After quoting the 1961 inaugural address in which President Kennedy declared, most famously, let us begin, President Johnson outlined the unfinished business of the civil rights agenda. Then, with three simple words, he gave voice to the goals of his presidency and issued a challenge that has echoed through the ages. Let us continue. In fulfilling this directive, President Johnson and the many leaders, activists, and ordinary citizens who shared his vision and determination set our country on a course toward remarkable, once unimaginable progress. Together they opened new doors of opportunity, 
helping to ensure equal access to schools and public spaces, to restaurants and workplaces, and perhaps most important of all, to the ballot box. Our great nation was transformed. In 1965, when President Johnson signed the Landmark Voting Rights Act into law, he proclaimed, and I quote, the right to vote is the basic right without which all others are meaningless, unquote. Today, as Attorney General, I have the privilege and the solemn duty of enforcing this law and the other civil rights reforms that President Johnson championed. Now, this work is among the Justice Department's most important priorities, and our efforts honor the generations of Americans who have taken extraordinary risks and willingly confronted hatred, bias, and ignorance, as well as billy clubs and fire hoses, bullets and bombs to ensure that their children and all American citizens would have the chance to participate in the work of their government. The right to vote is not only the cornerstone of our system of government, it is the lifeblood of our democracy. And no force has proved more powerful or more integral to the success of the great American experiment than efforts to expand the franchise. Now, despite this history, and despite our nation's long tradition of extending voting rights to non-property owners and women, to people of color and Native Americans, and to younger Americans. Today, a growing number of our fellow citizens are worried about the same disparities, divisions, and problems that nearly five decades ago, LBJ devoted his presidency to addressing. In my travels across this country, I've heard a consistent drumbeat of concern from many Americans who often for the first time in their lives, now have reason to believe that we are failing to live up to one of our nation's most noble and essential ideals. As Congressman John Lewis described it in a speech on the House floor this summer, the voting rights that he worked throughout his life and nearly gave his life to ensure are, and again I quote, under attack by a deliberate and systematic attempt to prevent millions of elderly voters, young voters, students, and minority and low-income voters from exercising their constitutional right to engage in the democratic progress, unquote. Not only was he referring to the all-too-common deceptive practices that we've been fighting for years, he was echoing more recent concerns about some of the state-level voting law changes that we've seen this legislative season. Since January, more than a dozen states have advanced new voting measures. Now, some of these new laws are currently under review by the Justice Department based on our obligations under the Voting Rights Act. Texas and South Carolina, for example, have enacted laws establishing new photo identification requirements that we are reviewing. 